Welcome to Bump Set Chat, the podcast where volleyball professionals come on and share their stories, experiences, and advice. And today, Shina Joseph from Team Canada and Orlando Valkyries. Welcome to Bump Set Chat, a podcast for volleyball professionals, players, coaches to come on and share their experiences, journeys, and advice. And today, I'm super excited. I, from the Orlando Valkyries, I have Shina Joseph. Welcome. Hi, nice to meet you. You too. And also, I would also add part of Team Canada as well. Yeah, that's for sure. I've been Team Canada for over a decade. Wow, that's crazy. All right. So the way we start the pod off is with three random questions. So are you set? Yes. All right. So what's the most interesting place you've ever played a volleyball match in? Oh, wow. I would probably say... I would definitely say in the Philippines, um, not because it was anything crazy, but I think it was just cool that all the teams within the league plays in one arena. Oh, wow. And yeah, and it's centralized in Manila. And it was cool to have, you know, all the fans who love volleyball, they just come and they stay for the whole day and they get to watch a couple of games of volleyball. Oh, that's awesome. I like that concept. Cool. All right. Second question. You're heading back home to Canada. What meal are you looking forward to the most? Oh, that's an easy one. I am definitely eating a poutine and a a hot dog, grilled hot dog, Mm -hmm. ketchup, ketchup, cheese, and onions. Nice. All (laughs) right. (laughs) Okay. So you're hitting the road. What's on your playlist that you're listening to? Deep house music. Yeah. I'm such a fan for deep house. But because it's a road trip, I'm also into the oldies, oldies rock, classical rock, just because they're great sing-alongs. All right. Hang on, though, because you're kind of young. What do you find oldies? Because it could be like 90s or are we going way back? Um, I'm going to like ZZ Top, okay. the Ramones, nice. uh, <laughs> Aerosmith, that kind of old. All right. Excellent. All right. So welcome to the pod. Uh, so how's the first season going with uh, the PVF? The first season is going pretty well. Um, Speaking from an Orlando Valkyrie standpoint, um, we had a pretty tough schedule. We played the top two teams. Um, We're done playing the top team, Omaha. We played them four times. And then we also played Atlanta three times. And now we're in the second half of the season where we're playing more of like the middle range teams where you have Grand Rapids, Columbus, and San Diego. Um, and Vegas. Yep. So I think it'll be a very interesting um, couple matches to come in this next month because yep. we've been on the road the whole month of March. So that's also very interesting. So we come home, train a little bit, then we hit the road to play our games. So it's been pretty good. Um, a very nice turnout of fans, a lot of support and the quality of volleyball. I'm actually pretty impressed. It's pretty good. It's hard to kill a ball in this league. Yeah. There's really long rallies. Um, and it's really cool to also see the different kinds of style of volleyball that you see from player to player yeah. and team to team. All right. Excellent. Okay. So let's start. Where are you from? So I'm from Ottawa, Canada. Um, I'm from Ontario and I grew up there. I was born and raised and I got a full scholarship to go play at the university of Florida. So I went there, I turned 18. My parents said, here's one box. You can keep all your stuff in here and the rest <laughs> You got to go. Wow. So, um, <laughs> so I went to college at UF. I played there for five years. Um, my final year, we made it to the finals of the NCAA and we lost against Nebraska. It's still one of my biggest regrets of my career of volleyball so far, not being able to win a natty champ for Mary Wise. Yeah. Um, and after that, I graduated I went overseas I started playing professional volleyball Um, I went to Bulgaria Taiwan Philippines Japan and France for two years and here I'm back in the U.S. Wow and throughout all these years I've been playing on the national team uh, for Canada every summer just going back and representing and you know trying to get that reach trying to reach the goal of being an Olympian. Yep. Excellent. All right. So we're going to go way back. When did you first discover volleyball? So I first discovered volleyball in grade five. And it's actually a funny story because going into grade six, I had a goal of making all the sports team at my school. Mm -hmm. And I did, except for volleyball. And I was 
so upset because I'm like, volleyball is not even a real sport. It's an old people sport. I, I did love volleyball because, you know, in gym class, if people don't know how to play, it's exactly it's, it's a very it's out, stagnant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So um, to prove to my coach that he should take me on the team, I tried out for the middle school team because they had a sports studies program and I tried out for the team. I was really bad at volleyball, but physically, like I, I could touch 10, 10, two. 10 foot two in grade five. It, yes. Oh yes. My God. <laughs> so they saw me and they're like, wait, you're pretty physical. And then they, they showed me just how to hit a ball just quickly. Yeah. And I bounced the ball and they're like, yeah, you're on the team. So I went back to my grade six coach and I'm like, Hey, I made the middle school team. So can I make the team now? And he's like, no. Oh, so, <laughs> so that's how I got, I got roped in and then I was stuck playing volleyball and then I fell in love with it. And, um, you know, I still joke around with my grade six coach and I'm like, Hey, imagine if you would have taken me on the team, Mm -hmm. but that's how I got introduced to volleyball. Oh, wow. And all these years later, still playing, what is the hook this game has on you? Um, I love how physical it is, but it's very individual. Like you don't have to be physical with another person, Mm -hmm. but it's just you being physical, trying to reach this ball. Yeah. And I love how technical it is. Um, You know, like not anyone can just step on a court of volleyball and do the things that we do. Um, And I really love the team aspect of the sport. You can, you're only as great as your setter and your setter is only as great as the passers. And I think that's such a important thing in our sport, at least, because in basketball and soccer, you know, you can be, it could be a one woman show Mm -hmm. and in volleyball, even if you are the greatest, if you don't have somebody to set you up and somebody to set that person up, you, yeah. you know, you're pretty average. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the whole contact thing I had, um, the coach from DePaul on and she was talking about, you know, volleyball is one of the most, you know, our hardest sports on the body for being a non-contact sport. And I was like, I never thought of it that way. All the digging, the jumping and everything. Yeah, absolutely. And just the diving part, you know, throwing your body on the floor like that. Sometimes yeah. I get up from a dive and I'm like, oh, well, that really hurt, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And now, you know, speaking of the hook, what's more rewarding for you? You know, um, roofing somebody a one-on-one block or a huge kill, you know, going around a triple block? Um, I would, I would definitely say I'm pretty biased. I would say a block because when you get that block and a hitter's just been, either they've been going off or they're the best hitter and you just shut them down. I think that feeling is so good. And also just the timing of it. It's mm-hmm. just, and for me, I think like blocking is one of the last skills that is taught in volleyball. Absolutely. And I've always put a hat on that for me to being a very good blocker. Okay. Because that could be sometimes the difference between, you know, you and somebody else in your position. So I definitely love I love blocking and it's my bread and butter. So I definitely say a good block. All right. Now the block or I've seen you serve and you've got a rocket getting that ace off the serve or the block. Which one are you going with? I would definitely say, I would definitely say getting a, getting a block still. Okay. All right. Yeah, for sure. Because sometimes I spin serve and sometimes I float serve. Yeah. But I feel like the serve, you know, you know when you're going to get an ace and you're kind of like waiting, you know, you're done serving <laughs> and you're waiting. And yeah, exactly. So I would definitely say a uh, block. All right. So now, you know, when you're playing back home, uh, you know, middle school and high school, did you play club ball or was club ball an option back home? Yeah, I did play club ball. So I played for the Ottawa Mavericks. And their local Ottawa club. And it was really nice because they practice out of my high school gym. Nice. So nice. it was, everything was there. It was easy for me to get to. Um, and I, my first year I played a year up. So I played 15 U's. Um, I played 16 U's, sorry. And then I played three years of 18 U. Oh, shit. And yeah. And I had, I had a coach, his name is John Spack. And he coached me throughout my whole club career and it was it was pretty amazing because he really just took me on under his wing and he like taught me everything and he's such a volleyball lover guru he still watches my games oh nice 
And every time I come back to Ottawa, we sit down and we, we talk about volleyball for hours and hours and hours. Um, so it's really cool because he really kind of installed that kind of like gym rat and like enjoying being in the gym mm-hmm. and being around volleyball. Okay. And now, you know, in those club days, did you guys travel mainly in Canada or did you come down to the north, uh, you know, the northeast of the States or did you go all over? Um, I, my team actually only stayed in Canada. Okay. So some of the other teams would play in uh, the Washington Classic yeah. or even like one of the Orlando Classic tournaments. But I always stayed in Canada. So yeah, um, I was pretty... I would say I, pre- I was pretty lucky because we didn't have to do extra, extra traveling because Ottawa compared to all the other teams that are around Toronto, it's mm-hmm. like four hour, six hour plus driving. So I was pretty fortunate to just stay in Canada. For yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. My daughter just started playing club and we did the travel thing. And just this past last month was my first time seeing a place where there was a hundred volleyball courts set up in a Boston convention center. It was crazy. Yeah, it is actually a whole different animal. Like we went to do a little bit of, you know, just being getting out there in the community and yeah. talking to the girls. And I went to the convention center and I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just trying to find the courts, the gyms, and it's huge. Yeah. And just the amount of even like the the gear, like shoes, apparel, the people that are, are like outside of the sport, mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty impressive. So it's really cool that American girls get to play in that kind of environment at a young age. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is pretty cool. Um, and now from a high school standpoint, how does how does a girl from Ottawa end up in Florida playing for one of the you know best volleyball coaches in college? Um, that girl played against another girl who sent in video <laughs> trying to get recruited and they saw me. <laughs> like jump and bounce a ball that's oh, what happened no way yeah so yeah it was it's actually hilarious but I think somebody on the defense uh club team they sent in some videos to Florida and we we were playing them and they saw me play them and they as soon as they they saw me play and they saw me jump really because Mary was she likes physical athletes yeah um they, that spiked their interest in me. And I would say Florida came in pretty late in my recruiting process. Um, I was, don't tell anybody, but I was, I was, my number one team was for Nebraska. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a corn husker for a very long time. <laughs> but, you know, like, and I say this to everyone, there's always, you know, there's a moment where you'll know um, this is a school you want to go to. And I loved everything about Nebraska, but there was still something missing. And maybe it was the connection with the coach. There's just that something that I, I didn't really have. So I waited and a lot of schools gave me pressure and I said, okay, like, it's fine. You know, people that really want you will be patient. And every time you make a decision when you're rushing, it's often not the best decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Florida came in in April of my junior year. They saw me, Mary sent me an email on a Tuesday that Sunday, she was in Ottawa coming to watch me practice. Wow. Yeah. And then she asked me to show my hands because she saw me palm a ball in the air. And I think a month later, she did her home visit and she was offering me a scholarship to come play at UF. Wow. That's so cool. And now, did were there any Canadian colleges or universities coming at you too? Or really, they you know, once you see what's happening down south, it's tough to play ball up here, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I think in my head, I, w- I went to, I was a army cadet um, and I always wanted to go to RMC. They didn't have a great volleyball program, but I think it was a nice marriage of two things that I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I started playing club, um, I got a lot of offers to play in Canada and pretty much a lot of coaches said I could pick wherever I wanted to go play in Canada, they would take me. Yeah. Um, but my first year playing club, I got offers to play in the U S right away. And, you know, like I don't come from a family where we have athletes and my family members know what, what the athletic world is. Right. So even for them, letting me play club was a big deal because we're very academic and Mm -hmm. educational, like driven. And so when they heard that, yeah, like schools will pay for my education fully. My parents were all bought in. Too. Nice. So they were like, yeah, just focus, focus on the volleyball, focus on your grades, but focus on the volleyball too. And I think 
from from that first year like after getting offers in the states you know it's kind of an opportunity you can't miss out and I just focused on that um, moving forward but every like I was friends with a lot of coaches from Canada and they always told me if ever you want to come back if ever you don't want to go back you can come here you have a home here so that was always nice yeah it's it's you know we were talking a little bit earlier you know Canada and the states you know just the the access to you know the facilities is just it's it's quite different you know and you know when we first moved down here to the states in Connecticut you know we saw you know the Yukon Huskies basketball play the women were playing and they were 15 yeah. 20,000 people back home you never see that in any of the colleges and back home I mean Canada you know from a collegiate standpoint and it's just it's such a different experience down here yeah I know absolutely um that like you said the facilities on its own is just incredible and also being able to they house the athletes they feed us um and the the, the level swag. of like the swag <laughs> yeah like at uf we got a lot of swag too so it's it's just another world it's yeah. a different world and um i think too just being able to play in a stadium like the biggest crowd i've played what uh, played in front of was like forty thousand. um so it's it's crazy you know what yeah. i mean like it's it's pretty crazy so i think you know the the sport is growing mm-hmm. and you know hopefully there's that influence in in canada it will rub off in canada but it's just a different world down in the states being able to play like we play consistently around like 3000 to 5000 6000 people the other weekend we were in nebraska playing in Oma- uh, in omaha and we played in front of, I think it was the biggest crowd, 12,000 wow. people. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Like I can't, like, I think it's just a really cool experience and it's amazing that all these people come and watch volleyball and yeah. support us. So I'm, I'm just really grateful. Excellent. And now before you picked UF, did, had you taken a trip down there and checked out the facilities? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did my official visit in, um, uh, in October of my senior year and you know it, it's October it's winter in Canada pretty much <laughs> <laughs> you go down and it's summertime everybody's wearing tank tops and shorts um and as soon as I walked walked on campus it just felt like like UF is very known academically in the U.S. it's a very tough school academically but you knew you were actually like on an athlete school like this is an athlete school like yeah the brand the Gator brand it's like no other, mm-hmm. you know, all around the world. And like, I have people gator chomping at me, like in <laughs> Taiwan, you know, like they're like, <laughs> so like, you could really feel like the, the pride behind being a gator yeah. and you're walking in some of the facilities and you have Olympian, Olympian swimmers, Olympian track and fielders, um, gymnasts, like just training and interacting with each other and that kind of culture, you know, it rubs off. So yeah. it was really cool to to see that. And my strength coach, he's one of the best, you know, and he's tr- he's won many championships for track and field a lot. He's produced a lot of Olympians. So it's really cool, too, to be able to work with some of, you know, world class trainers. So it for me, it was a no brainer when yeah. I got here. Well, also, the you know, you were talking about the brand and, you know, once you finish school, Anywhere in the world, you have that connection with any of the alumni, and it's just like you said, it's it's recognized wor- uh, around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we always say it's like Gator Nation; it's everywhere. But like, once you're a Gator, you're a Gator for life. And I come back. I, I still live in Gainesville for a reason, not because I love Gainesville so much, but I do. I do love Gainesville yeah. so much. But I come back to Gainesville because in my off season, I train like at UF. So I have my strength coach, Maddie D. He does all my strength and conditioning programs. Um, my athletic trainer, Randall, she does all my treatment and she takes care of my body. And then I practice, I get to practice with the girls Oh, nice! when they have practice. And then I actually, even in season, like I've been going to Gainesville when I have free time and I've been working with my assistant coach, Dave, And he's been giving me like individuals and we've been working on certain things, trying to get my game to be better. So I think having that constant support, being an athlete, even though I played six years ago, (laughs) like, you know, they still have my back and, you know, they still care so much about me as a person, as an athlete. 
And it's really cool that they're still a part of my career, yeah. even though it's been, you know, I've graduated. Yeah. Awesome. And now, you know, that first year coming down new country away from home, no family, what were some of the more challenging things you remember? Um, I would have to say like moving away from home was never like, uh, it wasn't really hard. Because, you know, I spent six weeks during summer camps on the army, yes. <laughs> army base camp near in Blackdown, near Barrie um, during the summertime. So I was already used to like, you know, being on my own for a while. But I would say the biggest difference was kind of like the culture shock mm -hmm. um, going to the south and, you know, like being a nice little Canadian girl. <laughs> like I'm off. I, I would have to say like. I learned that I was black when I came to this, like when I came to UF and I was on campus and everybody's like, I'm black and I'm proud. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you know, like I didn't understand that right, like, yeah. because in Canada, it's very different. Like, um, you know, we, especially in the volleyball world, there's not a lot of um, black athletes. Yeah. And so, you know, you kind of just kind of go through the motion, not knowing like, oh, there's not a lot of us playing this sport. And, you know, you kind of get, you forget that, you know, I don't even, I forgot that I was black, you know, like right. I didn't know that my situation is different than other people, you know, in Canada, it's very multicultural yeah. and, um, you know, we don't put a lot of emphasis on our, on our skin color and being in the States, you know, their history yeah. is so different. And, you know, it like is. being, being in that environment and also being in the South, you can really feel that. And it was really, it was a cool experience for me, I would have to say at the end of the day, because oh, I learned so much about like history, about yeah. my people's history, black history, but also just understanding a little bit more my role and my responsibility and understanding a little bit who I am. So I think it was, it, that was a really cool thing. And I would probably carry that for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I, I also say, I want my kids, you know, I want my kids to grow up in Canada, live the Canadian life and to have kind of that shock of like coming to the States and, you know, everything is faster, bigger, more money, mm -hmm. like, you know, work harder. So uh, it, it's definitely a, a culture shock, but it was nice. It was fun. And yeah. I was I was open to the opportunity. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. We noticed the first thing, I, you know, when we moved down from Canada to the States was the portion sizes of meals is like double oh. or triple. And it was like, holy cow. Yeah. Everything's bigger. In the <laughs> oh. And now, you know, looking back over those years in, in you know, at, you know, at college, what were some of the highlights for you? Some of the, you know, good memories. Um, I would definitely say like when it comes to tournament town, uh, tournament time, like we definitely get excited. Like now all the hard work and you're, you're going off that hump of like that November hump where you're playing the teams a second time. Um, and I remember there was my sophomore year, we were playing in the sweet 16 in Iowa and we were playing Illinois and we were down 2-0. and you know, like I'm on the bench, like I've been on the bench all season. I haven't played there's between the seconds, like after the second set, Mary comes up in the locker room and she's like, Shana, can you block a ball for me? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have my Afro, I have a headband and you know, like <laughs> both my hands are taped because my thumbs are like, and I was a middle at the time. So I come in and like the first, the first ball I get a block and it was just amazing. And I had an amazing game. So we got, we got to go to elite eight um, because of me coming off the bench. Wow. So that was a core memory. And I would have to say my senior, my senior season, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we were such a good group of girls. And I think we did something that took, it was something really hard, you know, like I think it had been since 2003 that we hadn't gone to the final, like to the final four tournament. So being able to do that and to do it with all the stuff, like all the people who supported our team, like they really loved us and we were just a good core group of people so throughout the whole season seeing like everybody support us every step of the way going to the finals it was something very special and it was also special for me because I that was my true season to play yeah. like I only played like my senior season was I, I started from beginning to the end and I was I was a clutch player in in the important moments for the last you know month of the season so it was a very that ring that we got, I, I always say it's blood, sweat, and tears. We earned that one.
Nice. And now, you know, you, you bring up a good point. I was going to ask, I asked a lot of the people that, you know, transition from club to colleges, you know, coming from club, you're the starter, you're the alpha. And now you're coming to college where it's like, you're a role player. How much, you know, was that a big sort of adjustment for you? Or you just like, you're happy to be there. I'll do whatever it takes. Yeah, um, for sure. It was a big adjustment for me. Um, but I think that's exactly what I wanted, you know, in my recruiting process, I knew, I knew I wanted to go to a school where I wanted to work hard and I wanted to improve my game um, and earn a spot to play because I knew I was an athlete that was playing on national team. So I knew like the, the better environment that I am, that I get pushed, the, the better I will get, the right. more I'll improve. So I definitely seeked out Florida for that reason. And coming into the gym, you know, like I usually was the one that could jump out of the gym. Now you had four other girls that could jump out of the yeah. gym. I was usually the strongest. Now everybody was strong. So it was definitely like, okay, like this is, you know, this is leveling out the mm -hmm. playing field for me. Um, and I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. But it was definitely, it was definitely tough, you know, in some moments. Yeah. And I think for me, like I said, like my true season of playing like a full season was my senior year. So that's five years in a program where I didn't get to have the same impact that other players had. Yeah. And I think those five years have made me, I've learned so much being on the bench, being a player who's, who is a first sub into the game or a player who's constantly getting subbed in and out. Yeah. And a player who is a starter, a core starter. So I think all those things that I've learned throughout those five years had made me a better player now, because now I, I'm a better teammate because of it, mm -hmm. but also it's improved my game in so many different ways and how I push myself and how I push my teammates and how I support my teammates. So I think, you know, it's definitely a big transition <clears throat> when you leave from high school going into club. Yeah. Um, I mean, club into college. Yeah. But I think now with the transfer portal, it's a different a different mm -hmm. story, you know, with NAIA deals too. Yeah. But I think it's made me a stronger player today, being able to stay in a program from the beginning to the end. Yep. And, you know, I, I was able to prove myself and I was able to really make a name for myself. And off the court, you know, I, I had everybody loved me. I was great. Everything was good. But, you know, being able to make your name as a player, um, within your program, I think it's something very special. Absolutely. And being able to being able to earn it is even, you know, the feeling is way better. Right. Than, you know, being given. Yeah. And so, that wasn't like, did you find a much, uh, a huge jump in far as the level of play went from coming from club to now college? Was it like, holy cow, these people can hit or were you able to hang with the people you were playing with? Um, I would definitely say like these people can hit. But I would say also the the biggest thing for me was the IQ. Yeah. So, you know, learning, learning about, okay, I was ball watching a lot. <laughs> and then you get here, you know, there's a whole system, ball setter, ball hitter, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. And, you know, I sequencing, understanding certain things and like also just the game plan, like prep preparing for games and having a scouting report. That was so different too. So I think those are the aspects where, you know, you can kind of you can kind of teach that at the club level, but mm -hmm. you can't really you can't really teach it until you get to university because the game is so different. Yeah. And you have so many more resources and, you know, people there is a guy that's his only job to scout other teams, you know. So I think those are the things that, you know, for some people who are who can get it, they can get it right away. It's easy for them. And for some people that it takes them time because they're more of a meathead player. Yeah. Um, you know, that could be a, a tough, a tough transition. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you brought up a good point there about the volleyball IQ. You know, when you play club, you're playing like 16s, 17s, 18s. You come to college now. Now you're playing with people who are from 18 to 22, 23, a lot yeah. of volleyball experience behind their belt and a lot of IQ. So that's, you know, that's probably a big reason why it's also a huge jump. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you can, you can bully your way through club, you know, and then once you get to college, you can only bully your way for so long or in or against certain teams. And that's definitely the difference yeah. I would say. Yeah.
And now, you know, when your college career was wrapping up, did you know you were going to go pro or what were, yeah, what were your options? Yeah, I definitely knew I wanted to go play pro. Um, I think being a part of the national team program for so long and being around other girls who played university and then they went to play pro, you know, we would always hear these like horror stories about the pro life or we'd hear amazing stories about the pro life. And, um, you know, you would spend the summer is pretty much kind of in a pro life schedule. You know, you're with the national team, mm -hmm. you travel, you stay in a hotel. And a lot of the girls always told me to like, Shina, you would love it. Like you just get along with a lot of people. Like you're so open to different people's cultures and stuff. So I always had that in the back of my head. And I think for sure, as college was coming closer, um, you know, there are people there, there's just like options you yeah. know like options and I think my my head coach on the national team he always talked to me about yeah like when you're done there's you know you can go play pro and he was a pro coach yeah so he definitely like talks me okay. into it and I knew it was something I wanted to do yeah. because I know that volleyball being a volleyball player only lasts for so long mm -hmm. right you have an expiry date eventually yeah or you step on the court and one day you know you you get hurt and there goes your so I think for me, it was the reason why I keep playing is because I love it and I'm super passionate and I love the challenge. I love learning. I love being in the hard pressured situation, yeah. but my body too, I can still jump high. I can still hit hard. I'm still strong enough. And as long as I can do those two things and enjoy myself while I do it, yeah, I'll play as long as my body allows yeah, excellent. me. Excellent. And now, you know, looking back, you know, not so much looking back, but if there's, you know, some kid from Canada is, is going to watch this, you know, a fresh or a senior or junior thinking about, you know, wanting to play down south, what kind of advice do you have for them? Um, I would definitely say go to summer camps. Like a lot of these universities, especially in the States, like they have summertime camps. And I feel like it would have been such a nice like thing in my pocket to have um, being able to go to, to attend some of these camps because a lot of the stuff they're teaching the kids are things that we do in our gym, you know, nice. like we were doing and to be able to just have a head start on like eye sequencing and the IQ of the game and understanding certain situations, I think would have been really cool. Um, so I would definitely say that, but also I would say just playing as much volleyball as possible, um, and watching as much volleyball as possible, I think is the best way to learn. Um, I remember I would often go see the university games in, mm -hmm. in Ottawa, whenever the teams would come in, I was at every tournament. And sometimes I would try to even work the tournament so I could get free tickets, you know, <laughs> just so I could be around it and like, see what, what, what are my, who are my favorite players? What are my favorite players doing? Mm -hmm. How can I use that to my game? Um, and I still, to this day, I still do that. Like I look at, you know, the higher level athletes or even the men's game. I look at a player who's a little shorter and then I look at like, what is he doing? How is, and even learning about people's demeanor yeah, and their energy and how they compose themselves and on the court. Like those are a lot of things that you can learn, um, you know, and it's free yes. <laughs> and it's yeah, free exactly. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, from the national team standpoint, when did that start? When did that pop up on your radar? Um, I think like I did a lot of Team Ontario. Um, uh, I participated a lot with Team Ontario. And I remember my club coaches, they, they had a sit down with me and my parents and they kind of had a plan. And they said, so Shino can play club for four years. And then in this year, there's going to be Team Ontario's during the summer or you could do regionals. And then maybe there's youth national team program and then she, and then this is a transition to like you go to university and during university you can be invited to go play on the national team so they kind of had explained to us a little bit of the process mm -hmm. and so I did I did um team Ontario one year and then that year from the tournament the NTCC tournament they were going to choose you know 12 to 16 athletes to make a team a junior national team and so I was chosen and then we like I was chosen in the next couple hours we were headed down to the States to play in a tournament. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty insane. And that was my first time playing for Team Canada. And then we came back and we had one month of training. 
Holy so God. it was pretty, it was pretty <laughs> crazy. And during that one month of training, obviously we were, we were training next to the actual woman's team. And I remember watching them practice and I was like, wow, like I want to do that one day. And I think it kind of just always came up as, okay, every summer, when, when are our national team tryouts, when are our national team tryouts? And then I went to my first tryout um, when I was in university and I made the team and then it kind of, you know, you kind of get invited back or you try out again yeah. and again. And yeah, it was, that's kind of how I got roped oh, in yeah. into national team. And then obviously you get, you, you get that goal of becoming an Olympian yeah. and making it to the Olympics. Nice. And what was that like that moment you, you threw on the Jersey for the first time? Oh, it was pretty special. <laughs> it was pretty special. And I remember like we were all, all of my friends now they're most of them are coaching. Some of them are playing and it was just like the cutest moment of like looking at like, wow, like it's so nice. It's so red. Like it, it was cool. It was pretty cool. Excellent. Oh man. And now looking back, you know, during your time with the national team, you know, what are some moments that stick out some good victories or just, you know, playing at that level is, is the thing that you you've enjoyed. Oh, um, there's so many good moments. Like I remember my first tournament ever was in Peru and you know, like I, I was, I was 18. I was just there because somebody got hurt, you yeah. know? And, and at one point the, my, my coach put me in for like a double sub or something and everybody loved me. And at one point they were chanting my name in Peru, so that my coach <laughs> in Peru, so that my coach would put me back in. And it was so embarrassing for me because I'm like, I'm the new kid. Right. And these people are like, Joseph, Joseph. <laughs> so then my coach puts me in for the last point and my setter sets me every single ball until I got the kill. So it was pretty cool. Um, Peru, I remember Peru was my first tournament and they kept calling me the black sheep because I had my little afro. Remember? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a, a pretty cool, special moment for me. And then there's just, you know, there's just all the players that you meet while you play, yeah. you know, um, now we have a couple Dominican players in the league and her and I, like me and De La Cruz were like besties. Um, and I think it's, that's the cool part about being able to play with the national team is all the travels you do and all the people you yeah. meet, all the athletes you meet when you guys go to a different country or you're together you get to actually be like, Hey, like friend, like, how's it going? Right. And you get to make these really nice like connections and friendships. And I think those are the things you're going to remember at the end of the day. And when we're playing against each other, it makes it even more fun because right. then, you know, she goes and like does something good and you look at her across the net, you're like, really? And she's <laughs> laughing, you know? So I think that it, it, I don't know, it makes the game a little bit more fun and more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now, from a professional standpoint, you know, your first year was, you know, Bulgaria, I think you said, right? Yes. What was that whole first year experience like as a paid professional to play volleyball? I hated it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I tell everybody, like, going to play in Bulgaria was not for me. Um, now, is this one of those horror stories like you hear about, yeah, you don't want to go play there. Or, you know, you want to go over here and... Yeah, well, I think it was also, I think it was the whole transition. Like, I came off of going to the national championship finals. I had, I was playing with my best friends, you know, like we had such a good group. I had all the love in the world, all the support in the world, just to go to Bulgaria where it's really cold and it's winter and nobody's super friendly and I was all alone and I was I was one of the younger players on the yeah. team um it was a very big contrast but they were a champions league team so it was a good opportunity mm -hmm. for me and I liked my coach like he was nice but he wasn't really good about dealing with the you know like the off the court stuff and the like player dynamic yeah so it definitely made my life <laughs> really hard and coming into a team that had been playing since September and I come in in January, oh, that's shoot. also a very tough position. So for me, those three months, I was getting paid really good, but I, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a car. It was winter. I lived oh. in a hotel, so I couldn't even like make my own food or, you right, know, or, or feel like a home at least. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 
I was in Plovdiv, which wasn't like the capital of Bulgaria, which didn't have much to do. Yeah. You know, extracurricular and not a lot of like foreigners, you could say, also were there. So, yeah, it was a tough, okay. a tough first season. All right. Yeah. When, all right. But so I now when learned... did uh, it start getting lighter? When was that light at the tunnel? Which which was next? Um, After it was Taiwan. And so what I realized after that, I played national team and I realized I suck at defense and my ball control sucks <laughs> because, you know, and when you play in the States in in NCAA, there's so many substitutions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time you play, like if you're a good hitter, you play three rotations in the front. If you're a left side, you might play six rotations, but you know, I was the opposite. So I played and I was the middle and then the opposite. So I really played three rotations and I didn't get to do a lot of, you know, the ball control and defense yeah. part. So playing internationally at the professional level, you have to be able to be a six rotation player. Yeah. So I went to, I went to Asia and that's where I, I stayed. I love the culture. Asian culture is amazing. Everybody's super friendly and very inviting. And I did a lot of defense and a lot of ball control and that helped me. So I stayed in Taiwan and then I went to Philippines and you're there. You're also, there's also only one foreigner. Okay. So you're getting a lot of the balls. Yeah. You're getting a lot of the balls and you're like the, you know, you're the go-to girl killer yeah. of the ball. So, um, so that was helping me stay on top of like my attacking game, but like still I was working a lot on my, on my defense and my ball control. All right. And, and then when I went to Japan, that's where, you know, it was, it was kind of like that light at the end of the tunnel and it was amazing. I loved it. Nice. Hard work. It was a lot of hard work. It was very isolating, but, um, you know, the, the Japanese culture is all work and nobody speaks English. Oh and I had God. a translator who spoke some English, but <laughs> not the greatest. So it was very, you know, like it was all business, yeah. which was great. Like, and I loved it, but, and it was also during COVID. So I didn't get to have any of like my family or my friends come visit me. So oh, it was shoot. super like eight months of work. Wow. And after that, I was like, okay, I need to go back to Europe. Like all, all the girls are like playing against each other. They get to like hang out with each other. After right. You're games. missing out right now. Yeah. So I was, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I love Asia, but I'm done being alone over here. <laughs> and so I, I came back to Europe and I think it showed a lot of like my game had grown a lot. Um, and being able to be a player who gets 80 balls per game and yeah. can perform is like very, is a very good val valuable thing to learn. And my, my ball control and my defense, I caught up to everybody so it was it was a very nice kind of transition. Excellent. And now going back to your 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 improving your ball control service reception, were there anything key things that you were you remember like the little things that helped with that or was just the repetition and just being involved in so many plays it just you got better? No, um I had a I had a Brazilian coach in Japan and I remember he was telling me he's like Shaina you have to make love to the ball you have to love the ball you have to give it you know and because you know every time you're just going so hard and I was like okay like make love to the ball and then I had like some other coaches you know you have to give the ball to wherever you want to put it so um those are like like little things that you don't really think about yeah but um that helped me a lot and also it's just about like reading, like seeing certain situations and reading. Um, I was always very fast, but I wasn't seeing it mm -hmm. fast enough. So it was also just training my vision and reading and then my body would do the rest. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, regarding playing in, in Asia and Japan, I had a uh, Chaz Galloway who plays for university of Hawaii. They mm -hmm. had a preseason trip over to Japan. They played the national team, or they played a professional team and the best college team over there. And he said he was. They got they got their butts kicked by the professional team because they'd never seen or played against a style like that before. You know, yeah. he, you know. He says we're just ground and pound over there. It's plays and just it's a different style of play. Did you run into that playing in those different countries as well? Yeah, absolutely. In Asia, it's, you know, they're obviously good with defense and ball control. So you have to be patient. As a hitter, you have to be patient. 
And it's like, there's going to be very long rallies, especially in the women's game. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of rallies and the speed is fast. The offense is fast. And a lot of the hitters, they're not as big and physical as us, but they're very technical. Yeah. And so they're just good about like getting on the ball fast and then placing the ball and yeah. making you work. And that's, and that's the whole thing, you know, like being in Asia, it's, they just play that different style and they love to play combo plays. So mm -hmm. it's all about like confusing the opponent too. So it is a very different style of volleyball. Okay. And now, you know, when it comes to your game itself, do you have any pregame rituals? Do you have a certain way of doing things? Like, okay, I got to, you know, I take a nap or I got to listen to this playlist. What's your sort of pregame setup? I am a firm believer of not having any pregame rituals because in case that I can't do my pregame ritual because of whatever happens, yeah. you know, there's always some crazy things that happen. Um, I don't have an excuse or a superstition excuse to say, oh, wow, I didn't play good because I didn't tie my left shoe before my right shoe. Um, but that being said, um, I used to take naps before, but then I stopped taking naps because I used to take like two hour naps. But I like to take like a fast, like 20, 15, 15 to 40 minute nap. Because I think for me, like during that nap, I'm also just doing a lot of visualization. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like go over the game plan before I take my nap. I take a nap. I love to take a pregame shower if I can. If I don't, it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I'm and I'm on the bus or on the way to the game. Or if I have a few minutes in the locker room, I close my eyes. I do more visualization. And yeah. All right. I like to like, I like to listen to music. I like to dance a little bit, get like loose, get all the nerves out and then to get into the game and feel good. I like interacting with my teammates. I like keeping it light. Like I really just like making a game day like any other day. So it doesn't feel like such a shock to yeah. the system. Yeah. I yeah. have to say your socials, you look like you enjoy life. You have so much fun. <laughs> There's a, it just says such a positive vibe around you. I, I love it. It's fantastic. Thank you. Well, I think for me, what I learned in college is that, you know, you get to college and you're like, oh, yeah, I want to play volleyball. I want to do so well. I want to be the best. And like you're on the bench. And then and then you kind of like lose your identity because your whole life you're like, well, I'm a volleyball player. Like I, I am volleyball. And so I had to learn really quickly that just because, you know, you're not volleyball is not going well. It doesn't mean that the rest of life has to go bad. And so I was very, very keen on always having a really good social life because no matter what, you know, like that will help me decompress mm -hmm. from my game, but it'll also help me like re-energize and be able to come back the next day and start all over again. Yeah. And having that healthy balance of like life, work, volleyball, uh, and your social life is so important. And that's, I live by this here. Like even when Amy recruited me, she's like, yeah, like, do you have anything to say? I'm like, I just want you to know when I'm in the gym, I'm all business. But when I'm out of the gym, when we clock out, obviously I still have in like in the back of my head, I'm still always doing everything to get ready for the season and get ready for practice tomorrow. But I'm a human. I'm Shina Joseph, not the volleyball player. And I want to enjoy myself and have a good time. So being able to live in Florida where I know a lot of people um, and have a lot of friends and just my teammates too. I have such a great group of girls. Like I love my teammates so much on this Orlando Valkyrie mm -hmm. team. Um, we just have a lot of fun. Like we're always doing something. I went to top golf the other day with some of my teammates. We, we, we went to the beach. We go out to dinner all the time. We play like games and it gets pretty competitive. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I think I'm somebody who just, I genuinely really enjoy life. And I think I'm also very grateful for this PVF league that is starting in the U S yeah. so it makes life even better being able to play in an environment where a lot of people care about you. You can communicate with all of your teammates, all of your coaches, um, everything we need, we have. And if we don't have it, people are working really hard to make sure that we do have it. So I have I have no complaints. I'm just really happy. 
and it makes our life easier to just focus on on the game focus on how can i be better how can i get better how can i improve my game how can i be better a better teammate so yeah life is good life is great (laughs) so and that brings me something i want to ask you so are the when you play professionally overseas uh, is the bench as fun looking or as do the people on bench have as much fun as you guys seem to have over here in the PVF? Because looking at the bench in the PVF, it's like watching college. You guys just love playing the game and you don't see that in other professional sports when whoever's on the bench, they're just, it's their job. They're there. But in the PVF and your team, you're having fun and it's fantastic to see. Yeah, I I definitely have to say it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same overseas. So Bulgaria's um, bench, nobody's dancing on the end, like no, no way, <laughs> not even on the court. Nobody's cheering <laughs> on the court. <laughs> um, no, like I think I think it's it's different because in in professional in the professional league, I think it's very it's very cutthroat and it's very woman to woman for every woman for herself. Yeah. You know, so you can get lucky where you get on a team where everybody's, you know, gels together and everybody's happy. But I think overseas, it's, you know, it's more of a job. Yeah. And I think and and maybe that will be the future of the PVF in a sense. And it's not because people are are unhappy, but, you know, like this is how they earn their money. And if you're not producing or if you're not on the court you know like you kind of feel a little bit like oh nervous and not stressed but yeah like there's risk like you could be changed out or not ready or you know so I feel like and for some of these girls like for us like especially in North America you know we do school and volleyball but we usually finish our education and then we go off to playing our professional seasons whereas those girls this is all they have this is their whole life so if they're on the bench you know, that's a big part of their identity. Um, so for them, it's not as like, oh, it's okay. Like, I'm just enjoying the experience. Right. And I think in the PVF, the, the great thing about the PVF is that we have created an environment, like we've created opportunities for people to yeah. play volleyball. So a lot of people are, are just happy also to be here, to be able to be in North America, play not too far from home mm-hmm. and some people, you know, they had retired and they came out of retirement. So I think the it's a very different, you know, different feel, especially for the first year. Yeah. But for yeah. my team, we genuinely like we are like this all the time, you know, like and we really get along and we really love each other and we really push each other really hard. And like you should hear the smack talking in the gym <laughs> sometimes or like, you know, when we'll play like uh, tennis or bagaroni, like it gets pretty heated <laughs> and and it's fun because once we get to the game we're all in everybody is 100% in and we come off like when we come off the court the people in my position they're talking to me they're like giving me energy they're like yeah you're doing great you're happy like you know we're hyping each other up yeah. or they're giving me information so i think as a team i think it's a culture thing and we've created that culture that we're going to support each other no matter what and we're going to push each other to be the best and and we're going to love each other through it you know so yeah. i think that's the that's the cool part about my team i don't know about all the other teams but i think there's a couple other teams that are kind of like that yeah but you know it's and that's the thing you know it, it changes depending on what country and mm-hmm. what's important and the kind of players you get yeah yeah i actually had coach amy on uh before the season started and she was excited for it and she has such a great vibe around her that like it's nice to see it's carried on to into the players that you know the team that she's compiled and put together yeah absolutely and she you know she told us today too she's like the hardest thing for our team will be is to make sure that we're like executing because she's like, she'll never complain about us giving effort. We always come to the gym and we're a hundred percent in. we're all working really hard, but sometimes we're having too much fun <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and you know, we're not executing enough. So I think that's like the issue with our team, but I think it's a good issue to have yep, <laughs> at ab- the end of the day. Absolutely. So now how did you find out about the PVF? Like, were you like, you know, somebody texted you or, you know, what, how did you, yeah. How did you find out? Um, I think like, you know, when you hear it, there's a lot of rumors, but when you hear that rumor of there's going to be professional volleyball in the U S 
everybody's kind of like keeping their eyes and ears open. And I heard about it. And at first I wasn't like too sold on it. Um, but then I was looking at my options for next season and playing and it was going to look like Poland. I was, was looking at. And we know you don't like option. the winter. So, you know, that's. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, all right, Poland. I played in France for two years and I loved it, but I, it was time for me to just see something different, different yeah. scene. So then I was like, okay, like, I guess Poland it is. And then, um, I had actually Atlanta reached out to me um through my university coaches and asked if I was interested and I said no and I came back from national team after winning like after winning against Brazil and um Amy Polly sent me she slid in my dms and <laughs> sent me a message <laughs> on Instagram and she's like hey like I saw your game like it would be nice to have just a talk and a sit down talk whenever you have the time and I told you, this is what I told you at the beginning. If anybody rushes you to make a decision, it should be a no. Atlanta was rushing me. Todd was rushing me to make a decision. And yeah. I said no um, right away. And then I, when I came back, I sat down with Amy. She talked to me a little bit about the opportunity that was going to arise for me to play in Orlando and to be a franchise player. And I, I couldn't say no. Like it was, I was excited about it. And then I figured I'm like, okay, be miserable and play overseas or be miserable, probably happy and play in the U S and yeah. then I was like, that's a no brainer. And to be playing like an hour and away, an hour and a half away from Gainesville is absolutely a no brainer. Well, also friends and family can easily make the trip down and see you or even see you in Columbus or, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the cool part. Like I've had so many friends be able to come and visit me, but also the PVF, they do a really good job with the streaming. Yes. And like everything is live on YouTube. You can go see the replays. And I think this is the first time my family has actually been able to follow me throughout my whole career. So I think that's also really cool. Yeah. So, excellent. yeah. Excellent. And now, you know, what was that first practice like? You know, you, all these, did you know any of the girls that were going to be on the team? Or did you come in like, okay, a whole bunch of strangers. Let's get together and make a team. Yeah, um, uh, I knew some players from, like, you know, some of my other friends um, or some of the players we played against each other, actually, when we were younger yeah. <laughs> in college. <laughs> um, but for my team specifically, like, and, like, some of them I played against on the national team, like some of the Puerto Ricans. Um, and we also have another fellow Gator on my team, <laughs> Audi Cruz. So I think... I really came in like I didn't know what I what to expect and I didn't even know how the level was going to be. Mm -hmm. And definitely the first practice we were like, "Oof. That's it's going to be interesting." But but we had mini camps in December. Oh, okay. And by the the last day of mini camps, we were playing at UCF and it was really good. And it was exciting. So and now who so, were involved with the mini camp? Was it just Orlando players or did you have other players sort of just you know scrimmaging with you guys? It was it was all the Orlando players. It was all the players that were kind of like recruited. It wasn't yeah. the final roster, but we were about 20, 20 some odd girls. Okay. And yeah, we were just, you know, figuring out, figuring out how it was gonna look like yeah. in January. And as you know, like in January we all reported back and we had two, three weeks of training camp and we they were cutting players like they had to cut uh, a certain amount of players and we had to have we had to go down to a roster of 16 players yeah so that's what we did and it was it was sad because like i said we just meshed and bonded right away right. so quickly but um but i think it made us even closer because we knew how um how special it is to be able to to play together and yeah. also to play in this league and to be a part of something amazing for the first year. Nice. And now with those first couple of matches, you guys, how did you prepare to play against a team that you've never seen before? Have no you know, no film on. I know that was the that was the one thing that was pretty like we're going in blind. Um, I think we focused a lot on our game mm -hmm. and focus on like what were our strengths, what were our weaknesses. Um, and then we focus a little bit on like, you know, we know a little bit about certain players on the other side of the net because they've played in AU or we've played against them or we've played with them. So we had a little bit of a general 
idea on like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do this against this person. But really it was, it was kind of like, you know, people going to play a pickup game of volleyball. We're just, everybody's going in and just doing adjustment as, yeah. as the game went. So it could explain a little bit more why we had five setters. <laughs> we had a lot of five <laughs> setters at the beginning of the season because, you know, it's a lot of just figuring out, adjusting. And then when we would figure it out, they would switch out some players and put in new players. And yeah, so I think uh, it was it was cool to not know. Nobody knew what to expect. Yeah. But now that the season is coming, like, you know, you have a little bit more of a game plan and you're seeing a little bit more of sweeps or wins in four sets. Yeah. And now, you know, like you said, we're halfway through the season. What's your take on the whole experience so far? So far has been really good. Um, from an athlete standpoint, um, it's been pretty smooth sailing. Um, the schedule is pretty hectic. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we play every team four times and obviously we're traveling like in a circle sometimes it yeah. feels like, um, but it's been, it's been pretty cool. It's been pretty cool to play this many games, to have this many games, um, streamed, mm -hmm. um, and it's been it's been really nice. Like we've haven't had any huge issues, big issues on certain things. Yeah. And I think it's looking really good. And all we have to do is get more people to keep watching, exactly. keep coming to play the game, um, more athletes to come and join the league. We're gonna have more teams excellent uh in the upcoming years. So I think it's looking really good. And there's also gonna be a competing league. Um yeah. so I think it's gonna it's honestly just gonna make it more competitive. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna give more people, more options and more, more athletes are going to want to come and play in the U S. Yeah. So yeah. that's the point, right? Like at the end of the day, the goal is to give more North Americans opportunity to play and let us watch more volleyball. Absolutely. Yeah. I know, you know, especially up here in the Northeast and in, in New England area, you know, you just, we don't have a team up here yet from a pro standpoint, but you know, I, I encourage all of our, my daughter's high school parents and friends to go catch the college games because you really see that next level play. And now hopefully we'll see a, a pro team up here and, and, you know, take it to that next level. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know, I heard some rumors, maybe a Canadian team kind of like getting it like the NBA having yeah. one Canadian team absolutely. as a first year. Like I think it's going pretty well. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, in a startup of anything, there's going to mm -hmm. be a lot of things that we need to fix and improve. Yeah. But I think for the most part, from my athlete standpoint, it's been pretty good. Yeah. From what, you know, what we're watching on TV, the product is fantastic. It's exciting. Uh, it's And it's exciting to see the players are excited to be there. You know, I think that's a huge thing that's really, really enjoyable to see because often you see, you don't see that in the other professional leagues. Like you just, they're there, there to do the job and then that's it. It's like, you guys yeah. have fun. You're cheering each other on. You're, you're all in. It's fantastic to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, that's you know this kind of brought the flame back into my heart for for the sport it's like i love i love playing volleyball but as soon as it's not fun you know you ha you're dealing with ma like management like overseas presidents yeah. are always too involved you know um and there's always drama around all a lot of things games scheduling all this stuff so it's really nice to just be able to focus on just playing yep. and winning games. That's yeah. the best part. Absolutely. All right. So some technical questions for you. So this one's from a, uh, a high school senior. So what drills or techniques have you learned to found that have helped your improve your hitting accuracy or power? I would definitely say like one rotating my hip, <laughs> um, the hip rotation, you know, it's kind of like, it's like throwing a, a baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, your hip actually generates a lot of power and and it actually also relaxes like your arm to bring like more of a whip of an arm swing. So I think that's one thing to work on, like those exercises, just like when you warm up, just like trying to generate and push your throw through your hip. Yep. Um, and for accuracy, I would definitely say just, you know, like putting having one block putting some zones in and then you're, you're hitting a shot, a different shot every single time. And then, you know, you can start with on an open net and then you add a block, then you add two blocks and then you add a moving 
setter. So then you're getting different balls and trying to work on different shots. I think those are, that's always the best. And like, oftentimes our coaches will, will give us bonus points. If we hit in this zone, if we do this, or if we get off the block and yep. that gives you more incentive to try to do something. All right. And this next question from the high school coach is what are some of the little things you've learned that you've learned that help on a, from a blocking standpoint? Oh, okay. Absolutely is eye sequencing. This is the more time coaches can spend with their athletes doing ball hitter, ball, um, ball setter, ball hitter, um, the easier the game gets because when yeah, we by, spend more by, with that, do you mean like just watching the, watching the whole ball? Or... Yeah. So, yeah. So when you're at the net, you're actually, you know, you roll a ball in and then you're looking at the pass. So the first thing is, is the pass a perfect pass? Is it an off pass or is the pass coming over? So if you can spend the time, like, you know, and you have to make it like a quick decision. Yeah. So if it's a perfect pass, so you know, that the middle's an option. Yeah. All the hitters are our option. Um, if the pass is off the net, then you can already eliminate the middle and sometimes even the pipe. So then you can spend more time on the on the pin hitters. Yeah. And then if the pass is coming over, then you know, like, okay, now you're not looking at anything. You're just looking at the ball. You're either trying to kill the ball, kill the overpass, or you're like, you know, you're recycling this ball and you're playing it out. So spending time on the first contact. Um, will help you a little bit like will help the game because the amount of times that people get perfect passes is not so much you know right. so yeah. then you can already open up and already focus on the your your own hitter and then the setter the setter gives you a lot of cues especially like at a younger age if they're going to set back you can see them yeah. already leading back if they take the ball forward you know they're going to go so they give you a lot of little cues. So also just spending a lot of time in the setter and seeing what she's doing. And then some setters have tendencies. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys ever noticed, but some setters, they never jump when they set the middles. And then they always jump set to the pins, which is something that's so small, but like you never notice that right. a lot of people don't notice these kind of things. And it's an easy giveaway. Excellent. Um, Excellent. And then after that is just like getting, you know, like we at a high level, we go the setter. We look at the middle's route, mm -hmm. so we know if if the middle is close to the setter, we're helping. If it's not, then you know you can focus on your hitter, and then you look at your hitter. So if your hitter, like as a pin hitter, like I'm an opposite, so I'm gonna look at are they coming inside, so they're gonna hit an inside ball, or are they staying, are they kicking wide, and they're just gonna hit their regular outside ball. And then after that, you're just going in for the block. You're going to get the ball. So. I think that that one thing I sequencing really helped me yeah. Um, yeah. as a blocker. And sometimes it's almost crazy, but you're almost like ahead of the game. You know, like you can almost know exactly what the setter is going to do before she even does it. So I think it's really good. And even for defense, they can be eye sequencing at the same time. Yeah. Excellent. I love it. All right. So now my question is, you know, you had a few bad plays. How do you reset yourself? And, and, you know, when I, Eric showed you was on, I asked him the same question. He says he wiggles his toes to clear his head. Oh, so I think when I have a bad play, I think it depends. Like sometimes I just like scream it out. I'm like, ah, and then I'm like, all right, my bad. Yeah. Next one. Um, or sometimes I actually like, if I have a little bit more time or I just like, I I'm feeling like I'm too flustered. Mm -hmm. I actually do like this quick breathing technique where I like block my nose and I breathe in for five seconds. And then I hold five seconds and I breathe out five seconds. And it's just kind of like a cleanse and like a nice little reset for me. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll close my eyes if I, if I can, <laughs> uh, if I'm on the court, I can close my eyes just yet, but yeah. But like a lot of breathing techniques helps to just like reset a little bit. That's yeah. why I scream. Yeah. Cause then it gets a little bit of the jitters also out. Right. <laughs> All right. And now, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, with professional athletes, especially with the volleyball ones that are doing pro and national team it's not all rainbows and unicorns you've you're playing 12 months of the year how do you keep you sort of like you know stay mentally fit and mentally strong 
Um, I think it's, it's taking those off times off. Yeah. You know, um, when you come into the gym or after, a, you know, after a game, a five set game, like those are, are super draining. And I think like, and usually the next day we're off after a game, but like on those days I am completely like brain dead, you know, yeah. like I don't try to do anything to, I, I really try to disconnect, you know? And I think taking those, like when, you know, as athletes, we often advocate for ourselves. We're like, if you give us an off day, give it to us completely off yeah. because just having to wake up early and go somewhere, it's not that you're doing a lot of mental work, but it's, you know, you're like having to like, okay, I have to be up at right. this time. I have to do this. I have to do that. So having a day where you don't have a schedule, you can go to the own rhythm of your own drum is very important and you get to like do the things that you need to do in order to like reset and be ready for another day's work is so important so i think that off time is so important for your mental reset and i know like for uh, for an athlete like me where i play national team during the summer and then i play pro we get we get during those times during national team where we've been on the road for three weeks we're, we're with a roommate every, every day where we can't stand each other, you know, but I think especially with our, our coach now, she really gives us a lot of like off time and she tells us do whatever you want. So we will go and we'll like travel through the cities. Like we were in Taiwan, uh, not Taiwan, Thailand. And we literally went like sightseeing all day. And sometimes like we, we were in Turkey one, one summer and we rented a yacht and then we just spent the whole day, like on oh, a wow. yacht, we ate food, we were relaxing, we were taking naps, we were swimming. And I think having those moments to just be able to like completely disconnect. And sometimes it's about also reconnecting with your teammates. Mm -hmm. um, it is really important. All right. Excellent. So now somebody who's played middle, and opposite. So I, I you know, uh, when Eric was on, I asked him this question because him and Taylor Averill go back and forth. What's the most demanding position in volleyball? So now, what do you think is the most de demanding position in volleyball? Well, I actually played middle left side opposite. And I would def I have to say it's probably the setter. Yeah. For sure, the setter. Because as much as, you know, we talk a lot of smack too. We were like, come on, setter, push the ball, set it higher, do this. I've said a couple times that it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, you guys are the best. Um, but no, like it, it is definitely the hardest position because they are always touching the ball. Yeah. You know, like they're always touching the ball and it's not a perfect ball all the time. You know, like the ball is moving, it's front, like, and not only they have to set the ball, but they have to set a good ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and not only they have to set a good ball, but they also have to make a decision on who gets to get the ball. Yep. In what situation, in what time, and can they physically do it or can they not? So I definitely have to say the setter position is the hardest. All right, there we go. And now, you know, you know, professional Shina has been doing this for a few years. If she could go back to that rookie Shina, what advice would you tell her about being a pro? I would say be yourself unapologetically. Never, never shrink who you are. Never shrink yourself as a player and your energy as a player because of the environment you're in, because of whoever, because the people, they're, they're going to either like you or they're not. Yeah. And if they don't like you, they're not going to like you you know, they're not going to like you for whatever reason. That is stupid. Um, and so might as well be yourself, you know, might as well. And I feel like when I came in, like I was in Bulgaria, like I said, um, I like really shrunk myself. Like my first game was good. But then after that, like I really shrunk myself because, you know, like I was, I was scared of my teammates. I was lonely. I wasn't happy. People were, you know, like there were so many things yeah. coming to play. And then it affected my game, you know. And so I feel like at the end of the day, like if you're, if you're here for the job, like we say, like, then do your job, then do it the best way you know how to do your job. And then if, if there's some adjustments to do, then there's adjustments, but always be yourself and don't change who you are Yeah. Um, because some other teammates or people, you know, 
right. people around you. Excellent. And now for that university or that college, I know Canadians, we call it university down here. It's like it's yeah. college for that college senior that's thinking about going pro next year. What kind of advice would you have for, for her? I would say, yes, go play pro. I at least try it once. Like I think everyone who's played volleyball, you know, in college should go and play at least one or two years overseas because it'll really confirm to you if you still want to play volleyball or if you, you know, you want to move on to the next step of your life. Yeah. But, um, but I think it's, you learn so much, you know, you learn so much from going overseas. And to be honest, I would tell all the college players graduating, don't play in the PVF, go play overseas because you really need, like, you won't appreciate the PVF for what it is because you're coming from a really good, you know, like a really good facility or good program, you're coming straight into the PVF. So you might even have higher standards than the PVF, you know what yeah. I mean? Because you don't know anything better than where you came from. But going to play overseas, it's it's eye-opening. And you learn so much about yourself, about your teammates, about coaches, about volleyball and the style of play. Yeah. And... I think those are, you know, those lessons that you learn when you go play overseas, they're so valuable because it helps you deal with, it's so valuable to volleyball, but also to life. Mm -hmm. It helps you deal with people when you don't know how to speak another language and, and you're just sitting here at dinner and you're just like, everybody's talking around you and you're just sitting there, you're like, wow. And, you know, for somebody like me, I speak French is my first language. Mm -hmm. Um, for somebody like me, I'm so conscious of that now that I'm like, if there are people around me that don't know how to speak the common, you know, like, you know, we speak the common language right. always to make sure. And this is something so small, but it's also something that goes a long way. Absolutely. For me, you know, yeah. um, and little things like that. And I think you learn so much from being, uh, from being also alone overseas. Like yeah. it's very, yeah. as much as you have your teammates and stuff, it's very lonely. It's super, it can be very isolating and there's a lot of sacrifice that comes to it. Um, so for me, who is somebody who is super, you know, extroverted and social, it actually learned, it, te it taught me how to enjoy spending time with myself. Mm -hmm. And now it's something that I do. I'm like, okay, I'm full capacity. My, <laughs> my social energy <laughs> is down. I'm like I need to go. Um, I need to go home and spend time with myself. And that's something that I don't think I would have ever known or done if I didn't go play overseas. Yeah. Um, so just little things like that, that I think it's so valuable, but when they, when they've gone overseas and they've, they understand the, you know, the, the thug life of being an overseas player and they come back to the PBF, they'll be like, wow, this is the best. This is amazing. <laughs> and you know, this is why I was telling some of my coaches, I'm like, I have no complaints. Yeah. Um, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now, you know, with the the national season starting, what's the plan for you for this summer and Team Canada? So Team Canada has a really good chance of making it to the Olympics this year. Um, we are ranked 11th in the world, and obviously 12 teams make it to the Olympics. Uh, six teams are already qualified through the Olympic qualifier tournament in mm -hmm. September. Okay. And, and then you have, you have two teams that get to go to the Olympics because one, you have France, they're hosting. Yeah. Um, so they take spot 12 mm -hmm. and then you have, you have to have one representation of an African country because none of them are in the top, Yeah. which they take spot 11. So if it was up to us today to making it to Olympics, we're not making it, but we have VNL, which is three, three weeks four or five weeks um, with the finals um, and we have VNL and that's our opportunity to gain points yep. and to get our ranking higher than 11 because obviously, and, uh, and we have really, we're really close. We would have to get about 30 points. And like last summer we ended with 30, 36, 38 points. Um, and by June 17th, we'll know if Team Canada is going to the Olympics. So it's pretty exciting. It's a very exciting summer coming ahead of us. And I think 
with the world ranking, the way they change the the way that you can make it to the Olympics, mm-hmm. the world ranking, I think it really gives a better representation of who should be going to the Olympics. Yeah. And I think it's really cool too, because the rankings, you can go up, but you can also go down. Mm-hmm. So that's also everything we will be doing this summer as Team Canada will matter towards our goal to making it to the Olympics. And we have never been this close um, in a very long time. So yeah. it's pretty exciting. Excellent. And I think one of the tournaments are uh, happening down in Texas, right? For the VNL? Yeah, Texas Arlington. So yeah. it'll be everybody come and watch. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, you know. When you're not playing volleyball, you're not, you know, working out, what do you like to do away from the court? We know you're social. <laughs> well, I, I'm i such an outdoorsy person. So oftentimes you'll see me like going on a trail, going hiking or camping with some of my friends, my Florida friends. Um, in Florida, we have a lot of natural springs. So I, you'll find me floating down on my floaty in a spring or like on powder boarding um yeah like i i have a hammock like on my patio so oh, nice. oftentimes i'll be out there i i'll be outdoors listening to music is always something that i love to do i i journal a lot and in my journal i do a little bit of drawing i read just hang out i i love to hang out with my friends too so just being able to so, like have deep conversation and connect and get to know people yeah. on a yeah. deeper level is always nice. Nice. Well, Hey, you survived the podcast, but, <laughs> but before you go though, like with guests, the past guests, I ask you to shout out or recommend a couple of people. One, maybe from your, you know, the Valkyries who have a good story and somebody in maybe the outside of Valkyries, maybe it's the national team or somebody you've touched in your volleyball life. You think would have a great story to tell. Oh, wow. Um, I, okay. I'm going to shout out Casey Jost because, um, she, her and I, she's my best friend on the national team. She's our libero. Okay. And she just won the national championship for, um, Texas? sports, U sports. Oh. Yeah. No, for U sports in Canada. Oh, okay. Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and she has a pretty cool story because she came into our gym this past summer being a practice player. And then she ended the summer being our starting libero. Wow. Yeah. And now she won another uh, national championship with her university team. So I think that's a pretty cool story. Excellent. Um, and someone else I would say, okay, I would, I'm going to go with Audi Cruz. Okay. Because she's a, she's a gator, she's right? Favorite. Yeah, she's a Gator. She's my big sister. She's an Olympian. She's done it all. She's 42 years old playing she's like volleyball. like Tom Brady. Yes, yes. And she still, she still got it. She still does, like, sometimes I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> um, she's, yeah. So I would say her because, you know, she, we were, you know, we, we all came out of, like, Gainesville. And it's pretty cool to, like, have seen somebody like play most of her career and you know somebody that you looked up to and now I'm actually playing on the same team as her and being able to like learn from her and all the things that she says to me but also like just to hear her like who she is as a person and get to know her yeah um I think that is such a cool opportunity because I don't think a lot of a lot of gators or a lot of other athletes get to like really know some of their alumni true um and it's cool because like, she's really like a big sister for me. Um, and, you know, I have her back. She has my back just because we're Gators, but I also get to really enjoy her as, as a person and as yeah. a player. So it's pretty cool. So she has a pretty cool story um, to share as well. All right. Well, Hey, thank you so much. Wonderful to meet you and good luck rest of the season. And thank hope you, you so make much. the Olympics. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was so fun to be on this podcast with you. Good questions. Thank you.